Welcome everyone. As some of you may already know, I am Laura and I am Manager of Preservation at Friends. For the past 38 years, Friends has been dedicated to the preservation and celebration of their architectural history, legacy, livability, and the sense of place of their free site. While our approach to preservation is a multifaceted one, historical research is deeply embedded in our day-to-day -day activities. We also get many inquiries from you, our community, wanting to know a little bit more about the bakery on the corner or the beautiful building that was just renovated. Well, I am thrilled to introduce you to tonight's speaker that will show us great tools and resources to finally find those answers that we've been seeking. Susan DeVries is a historic preservation and New York City history consultant. She lectures on New York City history with a particular focus on the early 19th century social and architectural history of Manhattan. Back in 2017, she did a similar event for us, albeit in person, but we're very excited to have her back here today. Susan. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here with you all, even if we can't be here in person. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now so we can start um, to talk about why we're all here. Um, I think it was back in 2015 that I started doing some work with the Neighborhood Preservation Center to develop some talks about specific neighborhood research. Um, so we did something in the village on the Upper West Side. Um, and on the Upper East Side to really give people some resources to dig into local history. And um, as Laura mentioned, the last, the Friends Talk was 2017. I think the last talk I did in person was 2019. And that in that amount of time, a large number of resources have come online. Um, as you can imagine right now, um, and I'm trying to forward my slides. Here we go. Um, the because archives, libraries, and other resources in New York are closed right now, and we're not able to visit them in person, they've really been doing amazing work to get even more resources online and accessible to us, so we can do this research from home. It doesn't mean we're never going to need to go back in person. Um, but it really does mean there are many more resources for us. And then this is a little plug to support not only the work of friends, but also our amazing institutions in New York, like New York Public, Museum of City New York, New York Historical, and all the other ones that are doing um, amazing work right now. And we're not going to be able to go through every single resource. There are so many of them out there. There's a little handout that you should be able to get to go along with this chat that will list a lot of the resources so that if we, if you're, you know, I'm gonna go through at a gallop, we're gonna go really fast. Um, so if you're not able to jot everything down, then you should be able to use this as a handy little list. This list is very much, um, things that are a bit more maybe specific to Manhattan and to the Upper East Side and also very of this time, like what is available now. This might change in another two months, it might change tomorrow as another resource um, becomes available. Um, so a couple of caveats before we start, and these are truthfully meant. Um, we are all spending a ton of time already online. And if you have at all an obsessive or detective bent, you're going to spend even more. Some of these are, um, you just will find you've spent three hours suddenly researching historic newspapers and you'll start to bore people and we're all trapped together right now. So that's a warning. Um, get organized and whatever that means for you to be organized, um, as you dig through these resources, you're gonna find a lot of little threads that you'll want to jot down in some way so that you can go back to them and either um, verify them or just remember where you found them. And you can't trust everything you find online. There are amazing resources out there, both primary and secondary sources. 
but you know most are created by humans and are fallible and just proceed with a bit of caution and i debated about putting the next slide in here i used it i think back in 2015 but it always makes me laugh and i figured we needed a laugh so i decided to include it um, this was created by educators and my sister who's a public school teacher uses it with her students and it's a way to show that not everything you find online are is reliable and her students are frequently not at all amused to discover that the tree octopus is not a real creature. And they say, but there, you know, there's um, scientist, there's a scientist talking about it. There's video, there's an FAQ section, it has to be real. And just because it's there does not mean it's real. Um, and there are amazing New York City um, blogs that have fabulous resources. And those are important to kind of note and take down. What we're going to really talk about tonight, though, is hunting those primary resources. Um, and the types of resources we're going to talk about. Um, a few different ones. For the most part, the maps, images, newspapers, that is kind of a personal prerogative. How, what order you want to do that in? But there are two resources that I really suggest you start with immediately if you're starting your hunt. And that's designation reports and official records. For the purpose of this talk, I chose a sample building on the Upper East Side. I chose it originally at random. I knew nothing about the building. I just you know, walked by it and was taking photographs and I chose this building. So 125 East 84th Street. And this is really a way to show you that what you can accomplish if you set a finite amount of time. I did not let myself spend you know, 20 hours or five weeks researching this building. I really tried to just give myself a few minutes at each resource we're gonna go through to see what we could uncover. Now, visually, you know, this building gives me some clues that it is an apartment building, probably an early 20th century apartment building, but otherwise I know nothing about it. So one of the first things that I would do is go to the designation reports. And this is both our local, locally designated districts and individual landmarks in New York City, as well as our state and national register of historic places. Both of these have fabulous information. Um, and we're talking about the Upper East Side and you actually have a wealth of historic districts on the Upper East Side. And even if you find that the building that you're researching is not within one of these districts, they're exceptionally valuable as documents that talk to you about the development of the neighborhood, um, what architects were working in the neighborhoods, and will give you a sense of what was happening when your building was constructed. Um, now, this is a great resource that's online through the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission. They have a landmarks map that you can easily kind of scroll through. Um, you can enter the address, or as I said, scroll through. In this instance, I entered the address and it found that unfortunately the building that I selected is not within the historic district. So that immediately tells me I'm gonna have to keep hunting. If it were in the historic district, for instance, one of the buildings that's in the map, if I clicked on it, it would give me a little summary of information. It would tell me rough construction dates. It might identify the architect or the original owner, um, perhaps even the, the style of the building or the material that it's built of. It would also give a link directly to the digitized designation reports. And that's important because although there's this little summary, you want to go to the designation report for a bit more thorough information. In this case, alas, it doesn't help me with my sample building. So I might go to the next um, record, which is the cultural resource information system, which it looks a little cumbersome, but we're really fortunate in New York State to have this resource. It's basically um, a mapping system of surveys, designation reports and other reports for buildings that either are currently listed on the National Register of Historic Places or perhaps were surveyed or considered for designation. And once again, you can search fairly easily. You can just plug in the address of your property 
or even the name if you know that you want to look exactly at the Upper East Side Historic District. And once again, unfortunately, I find that my building, our sample building, is not within a National Register District. But this map does show the boundaries and other designations that are nearby. And this can be important. Um, in some instances, our local historic districts um, and the boundaries of the National Register District are different. So I certainly have found examples where a building is not within a local district, but it is within a state district. Also, um, for instance, if I wanted to look at the Upper East Side National Register nomination, there are some attachments I can quickly look at. I can look at the nomination form at the time, also photos, um, which can be very valuable, um, particularly for properties that perhaps were surveyed in the 1970s or 80s for the National Register, but not listed. I've often found a survey form that will show a photo of the building, which can be valuable, as well as some brief history information that um, gives me perhaps a few leads. So we haven't had any luck with those two for our sample building, but there are lots of other official records that um, we can go to. And many of these, um, they're city agencies, they all have their own websites and ways to search, um, but there are a couple of tips that can kind of help you navigate all of these different systems. One that I use quite frequently on a free basis is called Do It. And it is the New York City mapping system that basically kind of aggregates all that open source data from all of the agencies into one place, which means it takes a long time to load. So do be patient as you click through. But again, you can enter your address for your building and it's going to pull up a page that will highlight your building on the map and it will provide a lot of information about the building itself. Um, also, it will include um, map types. So if you wanna look at a 1924 aerial, 51 aerial, you'll be able to click through and see that. The most valuable for us as we're conducting that initial building research is to look at the pop out on the side there. There are a couple things I wanna point out. And the most critical is the year built that you see. Please ignore the year built. In, this is my own rough estimation, but roughly I find that about 90% of those dates are inaccurate. They're more likely to be accurate if your building is of the 20th century, particularly if it's um, 1920s, 30s, and so on. But um, frequently you will find that particularly row houses or buildings from the 1880s or 1890s are just automatically listed as 1900. So if you've ever used any source um, that uses this open stream, for instance, Street Easy, if you go on there looking for a place to rent and it tells you when the building was built, if it says 1900, it's, it's likely pulling that information directly from this. So just ignore it. We'll, we'll give you tips to find that date a little bit more effectively. You'll also see on this pop out block and lot for your building, which is important to note, a lot of uh, city records, you'll need to know that block and lot. There are also a couple of other, other categories, building profile, which will link to the Department of Buildings website and tax and property records, for instance, which will link to the Department of Finance. Um, for our purpose, initially, we're going to click on building profile, and that is going to bring us to the Department of Buildings website. And again, you can go there directly, um, but the do it map is a good way to kind of link to your record. Um, on this, you'll find a lot of information. Again, you'll see that block and lot information. You'll see notes about landmark status. You'll see links to certificate of occupancy. Um, you'll also see kind of at the bottom left, you'll see action type. And if you click on that, what you want to look for is NB or new building um, in that pop-up list. And this is, depending on your building, going to bring you to a list of actions. Now, 
I chose a building, I happened to choose a building that is, I knew from looking at it, was probably early 20th century, meaning I'd be more likely to find an NB, a new building number. If you're researching a row house from the 1840s, you're not going to find a new building number, but you might find alteration records or other records that are of help. In this instance, I see an NB number. And what that NB number means, it's NB 495-26. And what that's telling me is it's new building 495 in the year 1926. So already I've got a potential date of construction for my building. Um, going back to that main page and the certificate of occupancy, um, these can all, that can also be something that's helpful to click on. Um, in this instance, I totally lucked out and it brought up a certificate of occupancy for July of 1927 um, for this building and it even identifies the architect. I will caution you, I've found definitely when clicking on certificate of occupancies in the DOB system that they're often in the wrong file. So I'll sometimes find one for a building that is six blocks away or a completely different neighborhood. So in this instance, I double checked the address, made sure it was my building. And just within a few minutes, I have an architect and I have a date of construction for that building. Um, once I have that, since we're in Manhattan, um, there's a wonderful resource, the late Christopher Gray and his colleagues put together a searchable database for new building permits, but this only applies to Manhattan and it only applies to buildings built between 1900 and 1986. So if you suspect that is your building, this is an amazing resource that will give you a lot of information with just a quick search. And you can get some search tips on their website, um, but what you'll really need to make note of is that NB number that you found. So in this instance, I'm plugging in 1926 and my NB number is 495 again. And what this will pull up is very quickly um, a transcript of the original new building permit. And this both gives me some additional information and it also acts as a verification of what I've already found. So it's giving me construction permit date, indeed, of 1926. It's confirming the architect as Schwartz and Gross. It's giving me the owner. It's a description and an estimated cost of construction. Another resource before we kind of leave official records that I want to mention is um, housing and preservation Housing Preservation and Development, or HPD Online. This is most valuable for multiple dwellings, but I don't discount it because for other types of properties, because frequently you might have you know, a row house on or a house on the Upper East Side that perhaps during in the 1940s was divided into multiple dwellings and then at some point turned back into a single family residence. This can give you some some good clues. And you just have to punch in the borough, the house number and the street name. It's gonna pull up this fairly basic report, but on um, down on the side, you'll see in yellow iCard images. And that's really one of the most, most valuable pieces of information on their site. That stands for improvement records, um, roughly 1901 to 1938. Inspectors went out and they inspected buildings and filled out little cards that often indicated who was the owner, how many units are in that building. Um, sometimes even I have found inspectors do little hand-drawn sketches of floor plans, which can be very valuable. So for our sample building, for instance, there is one for July of 1927. So soon after the building was completed, gives me a little extra information that there was a doctor's office on the first floor. It tells me how many apartments are in the building, how many rooms, how many WCs, information like that, that particularly later when you're trying to build the social history of your building, that can provide some clues.
Um, and I do want to mention going back to designation reports. In this case, although my sample building was not in the historic district, I wondered, you know, the art, now that I know the architects, what can I find out? And indeed, in the Upper East Side Historic District extension, there's a fairly extensive architect index, which provides me some biographical information and some clues about my architects in case I want to do some more primary source research about them, including other buildings on the Upper East Side that they constructed, um, their first names, some basic bio information, as well as references. So if I want to dig through the resources myself, I can do that. Um, maps. Um, this is, you know, one of those fun resources. And again, we're going to be going into, there are so many possibilities that I'm just highlighting um, certain ones that we can dig into. New York Public Library is probably their map division. It's probably a resource that I use just about every day. They have um, an amazing page that includes their fire insurance, topographic, and property maps divided by borough. And this might be too tiny for you to see, but basically for Manhattan, they have 1815 to 1955. And this is a quick way to just click on a link and get to a map for a year that you know you need. And many of these are fire insurance maps, which means maps that have extra layers of information. So they will tell you um, the material of construction. It will tell you how many stories, um, just information that will give you clues about the building. In this case, for our sample building, I chose to look at a map from before the construction of my building and a, a map from just after construction. So here we see it in 1921-23. We see it's not a vacant lot. There were other brick, the pink indicates brick, brick buildings on the site. And then we see it in 1930 after the construction, and we can see this new apartment building joining others on the block. These maps also give important information. If you can see, um, you can see the Third Avenue L, you can see the schools, the churches, the synagogues, other um, amenities that are kind of surrounding your building and what did the neighborhood look at in that point in time. And while you may wanna click and go to the specific block you're interested, at the beginning of the map, they will have keys that will tell you what those different colors mean. And that's important to know. So I mentioned the pink was brick. Yellow is usually a frame, a wood frame building. There might be stone. There might be a stable. There might be combinations. Um, so those key, always look for the map key to help inform what you're going to look at. Um, the Library of Congress, this is obviously not a New York City specific resource, but it's again one I use almost every day, whether it's for photographs or maps. You can do a general search. You can also search specific collections. In this instance, I just looked at their maps. I did a quick you know, search for Manhattan maps, found this slide is a little old, so there's probably many more now, but I found about 44 maps. And one of my favorites um, is this 1879 bird's eye view of Manhattan. Um, again, obviously built, um, it's a view before our sample building was built and it is an artist's eye, but it gives you again, a sense of what did the Upper East Side look like at this particular time? Um, what blocks were built up? What were still empty? How many elevated lines were there? You know, what did this look like before our building existed? And I will say as well that um, I find that the Library of Congress has many maps that perhaps New York public doesn't have and vice versa. So all of these resources, I'm not suggesting use just one, I use all of them. Images, uh, which is probably what people enjoy most and is the big thing that you can get lost in. And again, we've got a number of resources in New York City and I will say, these are constantly being added to. So, you know, tomorrow this might be out of date. Um, but these are the ones that I kind of use most frequently. And the one that I would suggest starting with is the Municipal Archives Tax Photo Collection. Um, many of you are probably familiar with it. And 
I'm sure there's a savvy bunch here. So there are probably lots of resources you're familiar with, but hopefully you'll walk away with kind of one new hint about how to research. But this one just went online within the last few years. And basically between 1939 and 41, it was a WPA project to photograph every taxable block and lot within the five boroughs. So it's really a great way to know you have at least one photo of your building as long as it existed by, the t by this year. Um, and in this instance, um, that block comes in handy, that block number. I do a little search for the block and I turn up images of the entire block. There are other ways to search. There's a relatively new website. I think it's 1940s New York. It's on the resource sheet that allows you to just click on a map and pull up an image. Um, I like to look at kind of my whole block that I'm looking at. I find frequently there might be a little glimpse of my building in, you know, in the building next to it, in the shot next to it. But if I pull up the shot, for our sample building, we can see it here. These are gonna vary in quality. Um, sometimes um, you'll be able to tell, oh, the cornice was already gone, or here's the restaurant that was in that storefront in 1939. And it gives you kind of a starting point for some of that research. In our instance, we have a lovely shot of the gentleman holding the sign and some great vintage cars, as well as a view of our building. Um, I wanted to mention there are a couple of kind of aggregate websites out there. Urban Archive has been working with the institutions across the city for the last several years to really um, promote public access, to increase the number of images that have been digitized and made accessible. And they started as an app, but they also have a map online. They started as a digital app, but they also have a map online. And it again is kind of a click on your building and see if there's an image. So I went to our sample block, alas, there is not an image in the system yet, but they're constantly being added to, but I could click on an adjoining building and see what it brought up for our particular building, our sample. Another one is Old NYC, which is a volunteers, um, project to map the New York public images. And it's a similar concept. You can click on a dot that is near your building or your block, and it will bring up images that are nearby. In this instance, it did not bring up an image for our current building, but it did bring up an image for the what used to be there before the construction of ours. And if we click on it, it will bring us to the New York Public website and will show us a 1920s image of the brick building that stood before it was demolished for our current apartment building. And again, I wanna say I use all of those and as well as going directly to the New York Public Library because I find that um, Again, things are being updated so frequently that I use all of these resources and have a variety of results. And it just doesn't take that long to do the search. So it's kind of worth the time. Um, another example would be if you don't want to click on a map, you're not looking specifically for the building, but say I wanted to find some information about our architects, Schwartz and Gross, I might go to, for instance, the Museum of the City of New York and just see what they might have pertaining to my architect. And indeed, they didn't have an image of our particular sample building, but they do have another uh, drawing of another building by Schwartz and Gross, 1929, soon after the construction of our building. And again, this is all important information to start to build the story behind your building and the people who built it. Newspapers. Um, this probably is the one where it's maybe the most significant um, during this time that we're in and we're not able to go in person to places. Um, a lot of institutions have really just made databases that you would normally have to be on site in order to view. They've made them accessible. Um, and a great example is the, oh, search terms, I wanna mention this. Before you dive into newspapers, um, search terms are important for 
images and for maps, but they're really critical for newspapers. And I can't state, overstate how important they are and how important you be thorough and how every search, every slight change in verbiage will bring up a different result. So I try to keep track of the search terms I use right now based on the information we found about our building. We have the address, which I search in a million different ways. We know the architect, which there are a few different ways to search for them, both as a partnership, as individuals. We know the owner. All of these I'm going to try in the various databases that we'll be using. New York Public Library, as I was saying. So they have a convenient database landing page um, that provides links to newspapers and magazines as, also, as well as information on their expanded remote access. And as long as you have a New York Public Library card and you have a PIN so you can log in, they've made a significant number of databases available to us at home during this time. And one of them that I would highly recommend that you try is newspapers.com. This is normally, again, subscription or you have to be at a branch library in order to use it. But right now you can use it and you can search by, you can limit searches by the state, by the year, even by the newspaper if you want to. So I did a quick little search and I limited it by New York. I limited it to the years kind of roughly before and after our building was completed to see what I could find. Frequently, I'll find early newspaper ads for rentals in the building or perhaps an article about the construction of a building. In this instance, I found an article about um, Governor Al Smith's daughter who recently got married and would be moving into her new home in our sample building. So these are important to just kind of keep track of because if you want to start to build the social history of what was happening and who was living in this building, the newspapers are a great way to start building that information. Another one that um, many of you may know and um, I've been using for years and years and is rather amazing is Old, Old Fulton. Um, it is one man's quest to digitize newspapers, many of them small town or neighborhood newspapers, newspapers that aren't contained in many of the other databases that we're talking about. Um, and it's a massive effort. And again, I find that different, a search here pulls up different information than, for instance, in newspapers.com. Here I've pulled up another article about someone who lived in our sample building. In this instance, it is a baby that was born um, in the building. And just another mention of Library of Congress, which also has an extensive newspaper collection. Roughly, they have up to 1963 available. Again, you can limit by the state and the year and by your search terms. This time I did a search for our architects and found about 224 results just for the architects. And as expected, a newspaper ad. Again, unfortunately not for our building, but it is adding to the list of buildings that our architects were responsible for. In this case, it's on the Upper West Side. All important information. Other publications were rollicking through this. Um, there's so much other information outside of newspapers that you're going to want to gather, whether it's books, periodicals, um, you know, it might be a home and garden from the 1920s that featured an, a, an apartment or featured a home that you're researching. There are specific architecture resources, um, as well as scholarly articles, there might be people who have written an article about your architect or about your building. And of course, I have to put in the caveat that these are, I'm looking strictly at what's available online. There are amazing other published books that if you don't have in your personal library, you may not be able to get your hands on right now. So this is all focused on what's available kind of online. Internet Archive might be one that you're familiar with. I find it particularly valuable for not recently published things, but for um, out of print things that libraries have contributed. So for instance, I've used it to look at 
wallpaper in old Sears catalogs. I've looked at it to put look at histories, perhaps one that was written about the Upper East Side in the 19 teens or for um, publications specifically about architecture. One that I find valuable for the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side is Apartment Houses of the Metropolis from 1904. Um, this is before our sample building was constructed, but again, I can use it to search our architect and see what else they constructed. And the interface for um, Internet Archive makes it fairly easy to search and flip through books. And sure enough, I find an example of a building on East 97th Street that was constructed by our architects. Again, just adding to the information we've discovered. Um, New York real estate brochure collection at Columbia University. This is particularly helpful for um, neighborhoods like the Upper East Side where you have larger apartment buildings that were constructed in the early 20th century. Um, you can search this by architect, by neighborhood, by borough. And as it implies, these are brochures that were put out to advertise these new buildings to potential renters or investors. I did a search for our architect and pulled up a number that were designed, including our sample building. Yay, finally some good information. And what this you know, can tell us is you know, how were they pitching the building? What amenities were they talking about? Even what coded language were they using to say who would be welcome in these buildings? I frequently find um, undiscovered, you know, names for the buildings. Sometimes a building that we now know by an address was originally constructed as perhaps the Colonial or the Riverside. And that can be an important clue if you want to go back and do some more historic newspaper research, you've got some additional information. Also, if you still at this point have not been able to verify an architect, sometimes these early brochures will be able to do that for you. They can also provide often early floor plans, which again, give you information about the size of the apartments, what amenities were there. If you're trying to look and see how did a specific apartment change over time, this can be very valuable as well. And also another Columbia University resource that I wanted to mention was the Real Estate Record Guide. This is um, 1890 to 1922, so it's a little bit before our sample building but it's a really wonderful resource if you have struck out everywhere and you can't find an NB number, you haven't found anything in newspapers. This is a good resource because basically it published um, new building permits, alteration records, mortgages, all sorts of information about what was happening in New York real estate at the time. And I've certainly used this frequently and found information about when a building was constructed that I could not find anywhere else. Um, social history, because you know, while the architecture is amazing and we love looking at these buildings, the story of our city is really about the people who inhabited these buildings. Social history, um, you gets very complex and it's another deep dive. It's not often a quick fact hunt to find just the year it was built and the architect. There's a lot more nuance involved, but there are some resources that can be valuable. Um, and again, many of these are now um, available a little bit easier from New York Public Library and other resources. So we're going to start with again going back to NYPL databases and if you can see here there's a little house. Um, if there's a little house that database is available you, to you from home again with your library card and pin number. If you see the little lion it means that's still a restricted to in-person access. In this case, Ancestry is available to us now from home. So if you don't have your own account, this is a great way to hop on and do some census research. So in this instance, I took a quick look at the census for 1930 for my building because I know from the research that 1920 census, the building would not be there yet. 
Um, and 1930 census, what does it show me? It shows me the number of people who were living in the building. It tells me um, information about their ethnicity, about their age, about their occupations, all things again, that will give you some clues as you're starting to build the story of what this building was like when it was first constructed. And again, depending on the age of your building, you might be going you know, back to the 1860s or forward up to 1940 is currently available at this point. City directories, again, a New York public resource and exceptionally valuable if you wanted to follow a specific person through the years, you can look them up in the city directory. If I wanted to find for our sample building, Schwartz and Gross, where did they have their offices? How, for how many years did they appear in the New York City directory? I can look them up, select a year and just keep following them forward. Um, and this is an amazing research that saves a lot of time, I will say. Um, so here's the info in our mad, very mad dash through these resources and not, you know, two weeks of searching. Here's what we were able to find about our sample building. A construction date with primary, two primary sources, an architect verified by primary sources. We found some other works by our architects, both through the designation reports and also some other primary sources and the owner at the time of construction. Um, some final tips after this mad dash, there are many more resources of, available out there. So use that cheat sheet and keep looking. If you're on social media, I would really recommend if you're interested to follow some of our major archives because I do find that they're constantly updating and saying, you know, releasing an Instagram or a tweet saying we've just uploaded X number of maps or we've just digitized this collection. Um, again, be skeptical about what you found, track the information and where you found it, gather as many primary sources as you can, and do step away from the computer occasionally, which I think is very important for all of us during this time. And thank you. That was a very mad dash, but hopefully if anyone has um, questions, we'll be able to answer some of those and you'll be able to use that, that resource sheet. Oh, thank you, Susan. Uh, this was great. A lot of new resources for me and I'm sure for everyone else here as well. Um, before I, we start with the q and I'd like to remind everyone, first, if, we, if you'd like to turn on your video uh, for this part, you're welcome to do so. Um, and if you do have any questions, please send them along uh, via chat to us. Uh, but before we start that, we, we did advertise this event as a two-part event. And we are very excited to use all these tools and resources that Susan uh, showed us um, to find out a few questions and maybe get a few prizes um, or a prize. Uh, I will just give me one second and I will share my screen and we'll talk about it uh, shortly. Um, so on our website, we do have a post that I will be sending over via chat to everyone shortly has this uh, wonderful photo of the corner of East 73rd Street and Lexington Avenue from the New York Transit uh, Museum. And we do have 10 questions about random buildings or people on the Upper East Side. And one question about your own building. So if you'd like to participate and get a copy of a friend's uh, Shaped by Immigrants, a History of Yorkville book as a price. Uh, you head over there and you send us an email with our responses. We will be sharing this hunt with uh, all of our audience, even with people that did not attend the event. 
but that will not be today. So everyone that is here live have a day or two of a head start on the hunt. So let me just send this information the link right now and we will uh, go over to Q&A. All right. The first question is, what if we don't find anything online? Are we out of luck? <laughs> um, you're not out of luck. I usually think of online research as a great first step. You know, in the future, hopefully soon, when we're able to go back to archives, doing online research is really both a process of elimination and information gathering. So when you're able to go to an archive, you're going with some information already handy. Um, I didn't talk about it in the Mad Dash, but it was on one of the slides. There are amazing manuscripts and archives at all of our institutions that are not just digitized yet, but they might have finding aids online. You can look at that right now and know that, okay, hopefully next summer or in the fall, if I don't find anything online, I know that I want to go look at this resource. So our collecting institutions are very important, whether it's information online or in person. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I do know that once we don't find things online, we just become hopeless and think that it's all over, but it's right. good to but, know that we can still go places. Yes, and there, there is stuff to find online. You'll be able to find at least one thing, if nothing else, online. All right. Um, another question, and I think this questions came in twice in different ways, and mm -hmm. is there a way to find ownership history of a building? And the, the second question also about this is how do they research deeds? How can you find out who owned their apartment uh, in let's say 1930s if the building was built before that and not by the same owner? Sure, so um, there are a few different ways. Um, it depends kind of the information you're hunting. Um, when I had the slide up that showed the Department of Buildings and the Certificate of Occupancies. Those are a good resource for sometimes who owned the building at a specific time. Um, also the city directories, census records. So for instance, you may not know who lived in your building. I'm just gonna make up a date in um, 1910 but you can find that building in a census record and that will give you who lived there, that will give you a starting point of names. Also, this is going to sound very basic, um, but you know, a Google search in Google Books, I use that all the time. If I've got just a last name or maybe an owner or even just an address, I'll just punch that into Google Books and sometimes, particularly in Manhattan, I'll turn up, you know, a social, a blue book listing that has that address and it will give me someone's name. But finding deeds is a much trickier thing online. New York does not have early deeds digitized. So by going to um, the Department of Finance, that was one of the links that I showed you, you can find more recent deeds, but pretty much it's post um, 1960s. You're not going to find those historic deeds online. So that takes more in-person digging. Um, the same with maybe some very specific information you might want about the construction of your building. It might take in-person Department of Building hunts. Thank you. Um, and you did touch on another question that is coming up. What about Google? How how can we make sure? Like, will the will the results that that you can find on the resources that you shared also be found with if we just throw the address and names on Google no. or? No, so yeah, some will, absolutely. But if you're talking about the historic images, for instance, that are in a lot of these different databases, a simple like Google image search will not turn them up. 
Um, so while I use Google frequently, especially as I said, Google Books, I use all of these databases because no database is perfect. And what is in one is not gonna be in another and they're just not gonna turn up on a Google search. Right. And another question is about changing addresses, lot margins yep. and stuff like that. Uh, one of our attendees said that their address is 59 to 61. Um, so which address should they use on the, on the, on the search mm -hmm. and how do we find that based on, on lot mergers and stuff like that? Sure. Um, so I don't know if you saw on the, our sample building when I pulled up the certificate of occupancy, it actually had a range of addresses and that's not at all uncommon. And unfortunately, what that means if you're doing newspaper research is searching those addresses. But in some ways, that's why it's important to start with the official kind of city records first. You can see what addresses the building has had in the past and also using maps. Look at as many maps as you can because those maps will show you what address the building had at that particular time. Um, also, it will show you if the street name changed over time. Um, and frequently in neighborhoods like Greenwich Village and Brooklyn Heights, streets were renumbered. So you will start to get a sense of it's not a different building. Actually, it's that the street was renumbered at a certain point and given that new number. Um, but the short answer is you've got to search all the addresses. <laughs> Just a little bit more work there. Um, and once we, we, you talked about streets being renamed, what about blocks and lots? Did they change number? How do we find like... Oh. Yeah, I mean, they'll change with consolidation, um, but you should be able to, by looking at maps, which will have, the, especially those Sanborn, those fire insurance maps I mentioned, that will have block and lot on there. And this is another reason to like, just keep a record, keep organized is write down all the blocks and lots you're finding on those maps, because if it changes, it will appear on those maps, as well as comparing that to what's in the official city record. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question <clears throat> is what are what are the things that we have to do differently if the building is not there anymore? Oh, that's a good one. Um, things that you have. Well, it's more of a challenge, um, but actually a lot of the same resources are applicable. It really depends when your building was demolished. Um, you, if it was demolished more recently, the chances are there'll be more news coverage. If it was demolished in 1850, it might be a little bit more of a challenge. But in effect, it's really many of the same resources, but you might wanna start in that instance, if you knew it was demolished, but you don't know when, you might wanna start with a newspaper research, you know, and do a dive there. And newspapers are not infallible for some of those things. So it's, it's a, again, it's a starting point. If there's a newspaper article about this building is going to be demolished in five years, you might wanna keep hunting and see, okay, is there an article about its actual demolition? Or you might wanna research the building that's there now and find out when was that constructed? That will give you a little hint as to when potentially your building was demolished. Um, there's also the Department of Buildings records, even if you look at the building that's currently there, again, depending on the demolition date, you might uncover a demolition permit for that previous building. And I find that a lot um, with, for instance, in the 1930s, there might be a one-story garage there, and then in the 1960s, that garage gets demolished and, you know, a high-rise gets put, put up, and you can see some of that some of those records in the Department of Buildings online. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Susan. We're yep. reaching out the top of the hour here. Uh, um, we, okay. If I haven't got you your question, uh, please send, send it via email. We'll be happy to redirect those questions to Susan. Yes, absolutely. And again, 
uh, we'll be sending out the resource uh, sheet that Susan mentioned uh, later today via email to everyone that registered to the event, as well as the link to the scavenger hunt. So you have a head start on that. Good oh. luck, and I will not be participating in the scavenger hunt. So <laughs> that would be very unfair. You definitely be the winner this time. <laughs> um, so if you if you'd like to participate, please do. It's great fun, and but also remember the very first uh, slide that Susan uh, showed. Don't waste all your day on it. Uh, Thanksgiving <laughs> is coming around. I know we're all staying indoors this time, but um, let's not spend it uh, hours and hours researching. Although I think I could do that. So much fun. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, have a good uh, holiday weekend. And I hope to see you next time. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.